Welcome. See a lot of familiar faces um, again. Oh, and Pia, nice to see you again. Um, you. Nice to see you too. I'm sorry yes, I missed well, the first two. We are really, really happy to have everyone here today. Um, again, uh, thank you for joining our Civic Dialogue series. I know some of you are new, but I see so many familiar folks. And so um, very, very uh, nice to have you here again today. We are honored uh, today to have Dr. Tim Eatman, and I'm going to uh, uh, introduce him in just a few minutes. But um, again, just to go over what today is about, um, just for those of you who are, are new, and this is something that you're, you're joining for the very first time. Uh, I'm Patty Robinson, Faculty Director of Civic and Community Engagement at College of the Canyons, and I am well up uh, here with my two colleagues, um, Kimberly um, Rosenfeld, who is Chair of the Education Department and uh, Women and Gender Studies from Cerritos, and Jan Connell, uh, retired from Cerritos, but also uh, an acting counselor, an adjunct counselor uh, right now at Cerritos and a 3CSN facilitator. Um, and so again, we are here uh, with our, our dialogue series and we're also joined by Rebecca, uh, Rebecca Moonstone from 3CSN, who is our uh, tech support. And so thank you again, Rebecca, for being here. Um, for many of you, you know the history. Uh, we started in fall 2020 uh, as a result of COVID, um, changing what was going to be an in-person presentation. We decided to turn this uh, into an actual series, and it has turned out to be a tremendous success because we've been able to bring in uh, civic engagement practitioners, uh, researchers, authors from around the country who are part of our series. Um, this work started as a collaborative uh, pr project through a Bringing Theory to Practice grant, um, and it has expanded with our most recent Bringing Theory to Practice grant uh, involving Cerritos College, College of the Canyons, uh, Los Angeles City College, Cal State Dominguez Hills, Cal State uh, Northridge, and then also Cal State Los Angeles. And so, we want to um, get everyone excited about this. Uh, we have two parts, as I've explained before. Our first part is our speaker. Uh, and then our second part has to do with our deeper dive. And so that deeper dive, for those of you who want to continue to talk and reflect upon our speaker's presentation, that happens after the, um, or goes into the second hour. Um, so with that, I just also wanted to remind you of our guiding frameworks. Uh, we're here to advance the understanding of the intersection between equity, agency, and civic engagement. Uh, we're recognizing civic community and democratic engagement as a high impact practice uh, and connecting it to guided pathways. And then also we are hoping to leverage participants' knowledge, uh, your current knowledge to build capacity to innovate for local and global change. And so with that, we are so honored today to introduce um, our most recent speaker, Dr. Timothy Eatman, who comes to us from Rutgers, Newark. And so I have a, a brief bio, although his bio is much more extensive, but I'm going to be able to just give you a little bit of the highlights about Dr. Eatman's work. Dr. Eatman is the new Dean of the Honors Living Learning Community and Associate Professor of Urban Education in the College of Arts and Sciences. He previously served as Associate Professor of Higher Education at Syracuse University and Faculty Co-Director of Imagine America, uh, Artist and Scholars in Public Life, uh, which is a thriving consortium of over 100 colleges, universities, and cultural organizations, including Rutgers University, Newark. Um, and again, whose members strengthen the public roles of arts, humanities, and design fields through research and uh, action initiatives. Um, also, Dr. Eatman is an educational sociologist who earned the 2010 Early uh, Career Research Award from the International Association for Research and Service Learning and Community uh, Engagement. Tim is a sought after speaker, workshop facilitator and collaborator who has earned national and international recognition for his leadership uh, in advancing our understanding of uh, the multi-faceted um, impact of public engaged scholarship. Also, Dr. Eatman for the past four years has served as a faculty member of the American Association of Colleges and Universities Institute on High Impact Practices and Student Success. 
He holds an appointment as honorary professor at the University of South Africa, um, and the, the, his, his, his work goes on and on. But one of the things that I want to also mention is that Dr. Eatman has written the forthcoming um, or the forward to a forthcoming publication that should be out hopefully next month or by December uh, by Dr. Uh, Richard Garossi. It is called Neighborhood and Democracy Building Anchor Partnerships Between Colleges and Communities. And so with that is with great honor, we welcome Dr. Tim Eatman. Dr. Robinson, uh, you have been very generous and gracious, so thank you uh, for, for those uh, kind um, comments of, for, of, of, of introduction. Um, it, it is truly an honor to be here, uh, colleagues. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I am excited um, about the energy that has come out of our field for, for field building, frankly, um, in this in these strange times, um, it is, is, does anyone agree with me that we're we're in some strange times? Okay, I see some nods. Uh, those of you that have your cameras off, which is certainly fine. If you know where your emoji button is, um, you know, uh, hit, hit it uh, now, now and then. Thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know how it is to be in these Hollywood squares and not getting any feedback, right? So think of think of me as, as yes, Kevin gets it, right? So don't do me like that, y'all. We don't have a whole bunch of time. I wanna ride through this very prescient theme. I'm thanking Dr. Uh, Robinson, Dr. Rosenfeld and Dr. Connell and, uh, and, and um, Dr. Moonstone for their uh, assistance in um, you know, framing out and, 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 and making the container for these these sessions, but uh, this this topic here, uh, strengthening campus and community partnerships uh, through neighborhood uh, democracy building, is, is just so critical. In fact, as we were um, uh, huddling right before um, this session to to do a tech check, we were just talking about you know the desperate need for us to do everything within our power uh, to focus on the the, the needs of of our um, of of our democracy, and that has never been more important than now. And so, I, I want to touch on a, a few things that maybe will provoke you. Hopefully, will provoke you. Um, I'm glad that you are going to have some some time afterwards to to um, to dig in a bit more. Um, I'm hoping to be able to spend a little of that time with you, but um, I, I really I really want to. Uh, provoke you to uh, keep very close uh, a set of questions about um, about strengthening our democracy. And I, I begin, colleagues, with inviting you to to think about some of the challenges that we're facing in our democracy. Um, you know, whether it's the um, the, the the challenge around <clears throat> equitable access to health care that has been so illuminated with with the pandemic or whether it's about the you know racial pandemic that we're facing or immigration or you know the the inequities that that are apparent within uh, our, our democracy around uh, the 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 uh, the scandal um, you know uh, Varsity Blue, some of you know about those things right in our own sector, right? Um, that, that professes to, to operate with such an important sense of democracy, whether it's the ways that we're treating um, uh, inequitably um, traditionally underrepresented groups and, and you know, the, the challenges that we're having around um, opening uh, discourse, uh, mitigating cancel culture, I want to submit to you today, colleagues, that really, when you add it all up, it's about shrinking imagination. I think that's the biggest problem that we are facing in our democracy, a shrinking imagination. And so if you don't take anything from this conversation at all, and I do want it to be a conversation, I'm looking forward to us having some back and forward. 
I want you to think about where you are in terms of your own imagination about what is possible within the institutions of higher education in which you operate as they are moving towards ameliorating our democracy. You know, I think one of the manifestations of our shrinking imagination is that we've got this discourse, right? It's like a negative discourse, the slow death of the university, right? The crisis in the humanities. I mean, you know, on the one hand, uh, Dr. Robinson, we, we understand it because that's how we're trained, right? We're trained to be critical, right? You, I, you give me an article, I can tear it apart. Like, that's what they told me to do, right? Um, but I think it's really important if we're going to take seriously the idea of this uh, shrinking imagination and being aware of it, that, that we do some introspective analysis about the ways in which we engage, the ways in which we think, the ways in which we operate, and that we ask some different kinds of questions. Now, listen, uh, you already know that I'm a little unorthodox. You can look at me and tell something is not right, that I am not well. Uh, uh, Rebecca's smiling. Uh, but I, I, I know that uh, Dr. Robinson said I could... Uh, make this as interactive as, as I want it to. So I actually want to ask you, colleagues, to few of you, maybe to, just to, to share your thoughts about this question, this different question. What kind of institutions of higher education does a strong democracy need? What kinds of institutions of higher education does a strong democracy need? What kind invites the opening of our imagination, right? Higher education helps us reflect on where we're rooted. Strong democracy really helps us to focus on what it's all about. So please, a couple of you, what, how, do you how does that question fall upon you? What, what kind of uh, 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 responses would you, would you share? Uh, with respect to this this question. And please feel free to unmute yourselves. So you don't have to raise your hand, just unmute yourselves um, to have, because we'd love to have the, the interaction with you, um, you know, in, 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 a, in a real time kind of setting here. You know, Dr. Eatman, my name is Dora Lozano. I'm from College of the Canyons. Um, I, I, you know, want to just say like, I believe we need institutions that demonstrate equity in all areas. And um, I'll be honest, I, I feel like I've been having an awakening this year of um, learning what equity really means mm. um, about internalized racism, culturally responsive um, teaching, critical race theory. There, there's been a lot of lessons for me this year and I'm starting to see because I've worked at six community colleges in Southern California, oh. starting to see the patterns and I'm starting to see um, the things that I've been blind to. Wow. So I feel like as educators, um, we need to look at ourselves and um, what are our biases. And, and I, I mean, I, it has to start with the faculty. It has to start with everybody rethinking the way things are done on our campuses. And, that, and that's literally like rebuilding our colleges, I believe. <laughs> Um, and I, but I think it needs to be done, and and I think um, that's where that's where I'm at right now. So just wanted to share, Dr. Lozano. I really appreciate your your uh, response here. You honor us with your vulnerability and your authenticity, and it taps right into this question of imagining. Right? You have indicated that you're learning in a different way than you had before about the gravity of these issues, right? And so um, these are uh, examples of ways that we can beware the shrinking imagination. Now, now I need to hear from at least a couple others. You're not gonna put all this pressure on me, have your camera off and not say nothing. So somebody, well, respond please. What kinds of institutions of higher education does a strong democracy need? Real equity is one of the questions that was, uh, or issues that was put on the, the table here. Um, 
Others, please. Dr. Freeman, I'll jump in. I put something in the chat there. I feel that to get to equity, we need to instill empathy, perspective taking, respect for our fellow citizens, regardless of their political affiliations, their race, their gender, their social class, all of those. And I think um, creativity, I do um, appreciate that you're mentioning that, you know, that we need to still think creatively about solving problems, but have the freedom to engage in that creative process. And I think sometimes that gets stifled with some of what's going on today. So, oh man, y'all, y'all are pushing me. <laughs> this is, this is exactly where I want to go. Uh, uh, Dr. Robinson, they're not playing with my emotions, right? But by, by, okay. I, I have to say, um, what is wrong with us in the academy thinking that disembodied theoretical uh, um, approaches to knowledge making are the most important? You learn with your body. The pedagogy that we study tells us that it's important for us to do the kinds of things that Dr. Rosenfeld just mentioned with respect to uh, growing and, 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 and we eclipse something really important when we, we bracket out, uh, you know, the, the humanities and the arts, which I will talk about in a second, and creative approaches within our democracy. So, Dr. Rosenfeld, thank you uh, so much. I think I see uh, Dr. Henrietta Hurtado's hand. Would you, would you uh, weigh in? Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, I guess I'll just share uh, my experience. In my experience, I never would have imagined that incorporating spirituality in higher ed would make such a big difference. I had heard about it through other um, experts, but having had gone through a, a program that actually embedded not religion, but spirituality and the, um, the incorporation of equanimity and practicing mindfulness and um, and putting all that creativity and all those comments that Dr. Rosenfeld sh uh, shared earlier really embodies spirituality because to me, a holistic education is not a disconnect between the psyche, the Ooh. mind and the heart and spirit. So that truly is a sustainable and authentic education. Um, and it makes me think of Bell Hooks as well, you know, education as the practice of freedom. Um, and there's no freedom, you're right. There's no limits when you're creative. So, yeah. <laughs> tremendous, tremendous. Hey, colleagues, thanks so much for, for, for taking me seriously and, and, um, and, and adding your voice to this question. I, I hope that each of us will jot this question down and put it in our back pocket and revisit it again and again. What kinds of institutions of higher education does our strong democracy or a strong democracy need? Uh, I think it will help us uh, beware of that shrinking imagination for which I've, I've made reference before. You know, um, <clears throat> one of my um, favorite uh, uh, poets, Langston Hughes, talks about the uh, question of imagination. He says, I dream a world your man, no other man can form. Love will bless the earth, and peace is past. I dream a world where all we know sweet freedom. Freedom is only the past. Happiness like our day. World I dream with black and white. Whatever rates me will share the bounty of the earth. The wretchedness will hang its head and joy like a bird. Tens and leaves. I dream my world. I don't know about you, but I rely heavily on the artists and the humanists when I feel like my imagination is shrinking. Now, you probably don't have that problem where you are, but I'm talking about me, <laughs> right? Uh, the uh, sort of quotidian challenges, the habits of thought, the ideologies, the practices of training that 
have uh, resulted in who I am and what I am, it, particularly in the academy. I have found it, in, in, in some ways are, are things that I need to unlearn. And so I'm constantly asking the question about how do I keep myself focused on a prophetic imagination? I want a sweaty, grind-giving, robust imagination, not a shrinking imagination. And I think that it requires work. Dr. Robinson mentioned Imagining America, Artists and Scholars in Public Life, a consortium that I had the pleasure to be in charge of for, for uh, many years. And the, the last project that we did, uh, Dr. Rosenfeld, before we left uh, this particular uh, iteration of the organization was a book project. So just quickly, the headquarters of the consortium moves. It was at Michigan, it went to Syracuse. We launched it to Davis. My team decided to prepare this book called What is the Work of Imagining? and to do it outside of our comfort zone, right? <laughs> because our academies and our, uh, you know, sort of theoretically heavy approaches uh, have certainly an audience, but we wanted to have a wider audience. And so we use story and image and we uh, contracted with one of our community partners who became our poet mentors and assisted us in developing this project. I wish I could give a copy to each of you, but it is called What is the Work of Imagining? And we, we talked about the importance of <clears throat> letting both hands go. You know how children do, right? When they're approaching a, a, an issue uh, that they want to uh, um, surmount. Uh, so, some of you have children. You remember when she took her first step from the couch to the coffee table, right? Letting both, you, you, some of you know what I'm talking about. So what is the equivalent of that for us in terms of imagining what we can use these institutions of higher education to accomplish? I think that part of what we're so good at is the rigor and the practice of what we in our book call conjugating freedom, developing the rigors and the uh, practices that help us go uh, deep and get refined in our work. And what happens is we tend to be at odds with this creative flow. We forget how to let both hands go as we refine those skills of conjugating freedom. Ever present is the challenge around shrinking imagination. And we know that uh, in order for us to really wrangle that imagination, we have to interpret <clears throat> these challenges. Yeah, the pandemic, these challenges. Yeah, this uh, uh, rampant uh, inequality in our institutions and higher education, these breaking points into making points with our imagination. I, I wish I could spend a lot of time talking to you about this book project, but one of the things I'm trying to do is try to help you to see how I'm pushing my own self as an academic to employ creative approaches to changing the ways that we engage on campus and beyond campus, to give certain kinds of thought to the way we create spaces with our community partners, with our uh, uh, collaborating institutions, how we cultivate and sustain approaches and how we look toward the development of infinite strategies, boundless infinite strategies. What do I mean? There was a time when planes didn't fly, right? What is the equivalent of that for the kind of change, Dr. Lozano, we need around these equity issues that you mentioned? We know that it is important for us to keep on the table, not only scientific advancements, but uh, to enjoy the arts and, and, and the humanities. And I think I was so glad that it came up in, in the responses to this question, because we often, I think, bracket out those important ways for us to think about how to revitalize democracy, to be in a creative place, to leverage our creative uh, instincts, to be cautious not to uh, jade our students in their desire to bring to bear these sorts of 
really exciting ways of thinking about knowledge making. Uh, Dr. Hurtado, you talked about the spirit, and so I feel like I'm in good company because one of the things that I did when I uh, uh, was was a director of Imagining America, and now they have an amazing, we have an amazing director, Erica Cole Arenas, who is a professor at UC Davis, where the uh, where the uh, consortium is now headquartered. Again, if you do not know about Imagining America, you really should check it out if you care about the cultural disciplines, the humanities, arts, and design. But Dr. Hurtado, creating spaces within the academy where hearts and spirits meet minds for deep, impactful knowledge making and healing, right? Right. I feel like we're missing the mark if we're never talking about the life of the spirit. Now, I have a faith practice. I could talk to you about that. But as Dr. Hurtado mentioned, I'm not talking about proselytizing, right? I'm talking about if we really understand the challenge of democracy, <laughs> we're not going to achieve that with just our minds. I know you're smart. I know you're smart, right? <laughs> yes, you're brilliant. But that mind alone, the body even alone, without the spirit, I think is a real challenge to us. And we've got to find ways to think and talk about that work uh, really powerfully I'm going to just hasten ahead because my clock tells me that I only have about 15 minutes left and I probably have 70 slides and um, <laughs> I don't know, I'm not going to get to it, but that's all right. I do want to help you to understand some of the kind of work that we have tried to achieve around the, uh, the, the question of um, uh, faculty rewards as a part of uh, imagining ways for faculty in particular to be more dynamic within the society. So Imagining America did this uh, important body of work around promotion and tenure and how to value the, uh, the, the um, uh, arts and humanities and artifacts that uh, go beyond traditional artifacts of knowledge making within uh, the faculty reward system. I, I don't have time to talk about it, but I want to name that and to let you know that this resource, a scholarship in public, which has really been widely used um, you know, nationally and internationally, can be an important uh, tool for you as you may be having conversations in your associations and perhaps on your campuses around faculty rewards. But, but you know, I want you to, to, to notice th this, the difference between just sort of thinking about a traditional model and and something far more robust, right? That makes us think about primary artifacts of scholarship. Yeah, sure, articles, books, technical reports, professional development, uh, presentations, radio programs. We're in the 21st century, y'all, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, you know, the, 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 the book projects and the articles, the peer reviewed work, which are important, listen, I'm. You know, I mentioned to a colleague uh, earlier, I'm, I'm overdue on five projects right now. Uh, I need some help. Y'all pray for it, brother. You know what I mean? Maybe some of you are also challenged. We need that work. But if we're honest, we realize that that work often is history when it comes out. And what about the deep community engaged work, the site revitalization plans, the curriculum plans, the literature projects, all of these sorts of things. And if they are actually valuable as artifacts, then how can we be more porous in terms of thinking about the utility between applied and basic research and research teaching and service? I could spend a lot of time talking about that, but I will not. I just offer it to us to challenge us to maybe begin to do some more conceptual thinking about the key elements of this publicly engaged or community engaged work. This is a map that I uh, have, have developed and written about and published um, in, 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 a, in a whole bunch of ways that, that uh, highlights uh, key elements of publicly engaged scholarship, uh, a continuum of scholarship paradigm. Uh, interdisciplinarity, career paths, clear and adaptable definitions, public good impact. I don't have time to go through them now, but I wanted to give you a taste of some of the conceptual work, the imagining, if you will, around really challenging issues like faculty rewards that 
uh, we need to be thinking about in this space. We have heard from our colleagues here today that equity is so critical and that in this environment of the p phenomenological, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, pandemic that we're in, you know, the question of, of, of equity and inclusion is ever more important. And so um, there's a framing around this notion of full participation that uh, I think is useful for us to uh, think about and operationalize work that is uh, pursuant of affirmative values and goals. And instead of just talking about what we don't need and what we don't have and what the crises are, you know, if we think about equity and inclusion in a fulsome way that is focused on creating spaces, maybe you'll remember the work of Imagining book that I just showed you a minute ago, but creating settings and institutions that enable people whatever their identity, background, or institutional position, to thrive and to realize their capabilities, to engage meaningfully in institutional and public life. This notion of full participation is something that I have been really focused on to buttress my publicly engaged scholarship as it relates to the larger goal, which is revitalizing our democracy. And we know that minimizing bias and inclusion and linking diversity and engagement are all elements of that on the pathway. We've done some uh, great work with institutions, just literally doing some conceptual mapping, some power mapping. Uh, you, we want democratic change. We got to pay attention to the community organizers. This is what they do. They do power mapping, right? They do uh, a one-to-one -one meetings. They do analysis and they get really strategic about it. And so we'll move forward on that. Uh, Dr. Robinson, I'm looking at uh, my clock and it says I don't have a whole bunch of time. Um, so what I'm going to do is hasten because um, I see within um, the eyes of the colleagues that I can see um, some people saying, well, Dean Eatman, what are you how, what are you doing in your own work? You talked about some research, but what do you give me an example of what you're doing? I'm glad you asked, <laughs> right? We are so delighted right now, colleagues, to be in a space at Rutgers University, Newark, where we have um, developed an honors enterprise, an honors enterprise that includes the honors college that was developed in the 70s um, and what our chancellor has called the Honors Living Learning Community, the Honors Living Learning Community, the HLLC. It is my honor to be the inaugural dean of the Honors Living Learning Community. And um, we're imagining new ways to think about what honors is. Anybody hear me? Right. Yeah. What is honors? Uh, now, listen. I'm a social scientist. My, my PhD is out of University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana. I'm an educational sociologist. I will make a survey, Dr. Connell, out of anything, right? And I will uh, start to smiling when I can explain the variance on the dependent variable. My socks will roll up and down. <laughs> Kevin likes that, right? Uh, and you know what? These are the approaches we use in the academy, right? So who are the honor students on your campus? They're the ones that have scored really high in these standardized tests. But what do the tests tell us, colleagues? As a social scientist, I can, and I know some of you know, that they really don't tell us more than information about a person's family wealth, right? So if that's the case, then why do we fetishize that when it comes to honors? How about if you want to stay in your community and navigate college rather than going to other places that you might have gotten into, Duke, Syracuse, you know, uh, uh, Davis, you know, uh, uh, you know, Michigan, other places. How about if you want to stay in your community that that's something that we should honor? How about that? How about we look at your background and get a, a clearer sense of the resilience that you bring to bear and honor that. How about we reimagine what honors 
looks like. Not ignoring academic excellence. Absolutely not. That is critical. But as we said a little bit earlier, recognizing that the breadth of knowledge is not only about the head, but there are these multiple dimensions. So we are revolutionizing honors, we are cultivating talent, and we're engaging communities on our path towards connecting campus and community and revitalizing our democracy. We are stopping this overlooking of local talent. In the last eight years, Rutgers University Newark, the campus that we're located on, has seen um, an increase, an 80% increase in Newark residents who are at Rutgers University Newark. We have about 15,000 students, so it's uh, not a huge campus, right? But that is significance. I didn't say eight, I said eight zero. There's been an 80% increase in Newark residents. The young people that are pictured here, if you go to our website, you'll see them. And I have to tell you, none of you here are like this, but people look at this picture and they don't say they see honors. They see something else. I won't go into what they say they see or what they don't say they see. But I'm going to tell you one thing. Uh, this brother here, Ty Lynn Johnson, uh, graduated last year and he works for BlackRock. <laughs> He's got a good corporate job. You follow what I mean? Uh, I can tell you that this uh, sister here, Vivian Peralta, whose artwork I'm going to show you in a minute, just got a five-year uh, uh, full ride at Texas A&M for her PhD in biosciences. She's a, an, an amazing scholar. Uh, Amanda Fabry is uh, working on her PhD in, in uh, kinesiology. Uh, we have a, a scholar that is just graduated from Harvard Law School who came in as a transfer student. I'm going to talk to your community college, to my community college colleagues in a second. Um, uh, powerful imagining of what it means to cultivate talent. And of course, we can't do that without engaging communities. We know the experiential learning is absolutely critical in this regard. So, uh, Dean Eatman, you don't look at SAT scores or ACT scores at all. What do you do? I'm glad you asked. We bring together, in a large group interview, up to... 200 students for three hours. Somebody said, uh, they, they glad their camera's off because they just confirmed that he is not well. He's not a well man, <laughs> right? For three hours, 200 students. And we watch them. We put them up for, cha for, for uh, 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 challenging activities. And we have an army of evaluators like my colleagues sitting off to the side here. The students are engaged in the process of creating communities. And we listen to their discourse. We watch how they engage with each other. We're in the process of trying to pull together the cohort of 80 scholars who will be in the Honors Living Learning community each year. We started in 2016 with this large group interview process. Yes, it takes a lot of time, but I can tell you we have partnership with folks on campus in the chancellor's office, faculty, uh, um, public safety. We have community uh, um, uh, organizations that are helping us serve as evaluators, uh, working with us on our rubric to bring back about 60% of the thousand students that come through on a cycle. We're trying to imagine a more democratic approach to admissions, right? To connecting with communities. You already know that I said we have 80% increase in four years of local students. That must mean that when our students come on campus and they do community engagement work, they're going home when they do that work, right? right? This is not, some, you know, we're going to go and, and, and look at some ex exoticized, you know, uh, you know uh, fantasy space that, that uh, is, is removed from their experience. They're going to see mama and them. Does that make sense? <laughs> and so I, I think, uh, don't laugh at me, Rebecca. What, what, I want, what I want to do is emphasize that this cultivating talent piece gets operationalized through the interview process. Of course, we would not 
make any decisions based on a large group interview. So we bring about 60% of the students for personal interviews. And guess what? During that time, which are one-to-one -one, uh, opportunities, we dig down into the student's experience academically. What does your academic transcript tell uh, me about you, uh, uh, Miss Miss Pia? I'm just picking on you, Dr. Kennedy. All right? What is what is your what is what is your uh, uh, your transcript? And the students will say, "Well, Dr. Eatman, um, you know, I, I have a pretty good average, but what people wouldn't know without this conversation is that we moved seven times when I was a freshman." <laughs> which of us <laughs> which of us could sustain that? Does that make sense? I mean, we get their stories. Are you hearing? Uh, we, we, you know, we, we give them an opportunity for them to share where their challenges are. And by the way, with the public education system in Newark, like many uh, uh, cities, leaving much to be desired, we're excited about the opportunity of identifying not just the students who are at the top of their game academically. Oh my goodness, I am out of time. <laughs> no, no. That can't be. Even don't don't worry about the time. Okay. Um, please. <laughs> all right, all right. You give me give me give me seven more minutes. All right. Okay. So 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 um, I did get carried away. Um, all right. So that's really important. But we look at the HLLC as not only a scholarship, uh, because it's a scholarship for room and board. Somebody, uh, please hear me well. It is a merit scholarship for room and board. It is not because you are any particular color, right? It is a rigorous uh, uh, admissions process, which I just detailed in sublevel, and the scholarship is room and board. It's not tuition, it is room and board. We do work with the students on uh, some uh, tools that uh, the campus has in place to assist students that have a certain family um, um, you know, income threshold. But it's a scholarship and it is also a curriculum, right? And so Vivian Peralta, who I showed you a minute ago, who's at Texas A&M now doing her PhD, uh, came in as a first year student. So she spent four years with us, right? Um, uh, other students uh, like the Harvard Law grad that I just mentioned came in as a transfer student, right? So uh, Mo, Mo only spent two years with us. Does that make sense? And so we have cohorts of 80, 50 of them are 17 and 8 year old, 18 year olds coming out of high school, and 30 of them are community college graduates who come in with an associate's degree. I can hear some of you, your community college, uh, uh, my community college colleagues just getting excited about thinking uh, about a community college student having the opportunity to live on campus for two years, right, and to engage. One of the reasons I have all this white hair, uh, uh, Dr. Hurtado, it's not because I'm so old, it's because I have 35-year-olds and 17-year-olds living and learning together. <laughs> you, you understand what I'm saying, right? Actually, I have 50-year-olds. The oldest person who is an honors living learning community scholar is 60 years old. And she lives in our space on campus. Does that make sense? And by the way, we have folks that are veterans. We have folks that are, are parents. Uh, uh, we have folks that are aged out of the foster care system. We have folks that are formerly incarcerated. I have a graduate now spent 30 years in jail. 30 years. Uh, he doesn't even know what this is. But when you get him and a 17-year-old together and engaging not only about topics, but about technology, it's really powerful. I, I cannot go uh, uh, into detail on the curriculum. Suffice it to say that it is critical for us to have that part. Here's the image that I wanted to share with you from um, Vivian Peralta, because uh, the course I teach, I co-teach it, is called Local Citizenship in a Global World. And yeah, they do the APA style research paper and you know all of that stuff in the essays and you know, and we say for their final project, you show me what you learned in your way. Are you hearing me? Yeah, you show me in your way. Some people do comedy sketches. Is that is that too radical for your classroom? Some people do. Uh, uh, I've had someone choreograph a dance piece. Y'all not listening to me. 
you know what, uh, Dr. Robinson, I'm just going to leave because they not, they don't, they don't, they not, they not, they think I'm joking around. Vivian did this illustration of educational inequality. Do you see her? If you know her, when her hair is braided down, that's her. And look into the shadows. Are y'all with me? Do you see the community members in the shadows? Anybody see it? Do you see them literally using her body as a conduit toward the development of the drawing of the balance of justice, which is on the head of a man of color? Do you see this other man of color behind the wall with a illustration of his connection to the carceral system? You know that this challenge we're at. Doing things to balance the scales, but things that are untoward. Do, do you see Uncle Sam whispering lies into a weeping ear of Lady Justice? Huh? Do you see this sister standing behind the wall with a, a, a book that has history spelled backwards on it because of the educational inequality? This, colleagues, is going to be the mural in our new building. And I'm so excited about um, that opportunity to honor Vivian's work. I must stop. Uh, just let me get a few more minutes. We are serious about community engagement and publicly engaged scholarship and using creative approaches towards revitalizing our democracy within Newark, New Jersey. We are engaging with uh, spaces like the Truth Racial Healing and Transformation Center, which is a campus center. Some of you know the Association of American Colleges and Universities started that with Kellogg of funds um, several years ago. We were among the first group uh, uh, and our students are doing hands-on work, learning how to conduct intergroup dialogue and engaging in you know, creative projects, uh, uh, artistic projects like the Healing Sounds of Newark where they uh, pull together um, uh, spaces where poetry is shared and, and, and music and dance and all of these sorts of things towards racial healing taking on uh, uh, difficult you know, uh, subjects and challenges with both on campus and with, uh, within the community. Also, I'm pleased that we've got a project uh, right now on reparations uh, within Newark. And um, uh, I happen to be, I'm blessed to be the co-lead of the project that is uh, in conjunction is sort of subgranted through the University of Michigan. We've got nine campuses from around the country that are involved in this work where each of our campuses are thinking deeply about the question of um, what reparations would look like um, uh, as we would develop sort of recommendations and plans uh, for that work. And so two examples of some of the community engaged uh, work we're doing in that regard. Um, and I think I mentioned in passing, we have been blessed to um, open the doors on our building project. We had an $80 million building, which is simply amazing. Uh, you can uh, just imagine how much agita I had as it sat empty all last year, <laughs> but we are now in it and we're excited because it was designed to manifest the vision of the honors living learning community. So, uh, we've got buku lounge spaces where the students can continue conversations uh, from class. The 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 uh, residence halls, uh, the residence suites. There are 390. We could sleep up to 391 students in the space, but uh, th those spaces, um, you know, are, are a bit smaller than traditional. But we're driving the students into booths and into wellness spaces and into collaboration spaces. It's a multi-use uh, building with classrooms, but also uh, you'll notice here that there's a uh, open to the sky piazza and, 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 and there, that, that's an opportunity for us to gather uh, community partners and to engage in that space and in other spaces uh, within the building. I'm excited, very, very excited about that expression uh, of um, the vision, uh, which has been supported by our chancellor, 
Um, you know, our chancellor understands deeply the importance of the humanities and the arts in terms of knowledge making and publicly engaged scholarship. Uh, you'll notice that right behind us uh, are some pretty impressive buildings. Um, that is uh, the headquarters of Prudential. And we, uh, a few years ago, received a $10 million endowment gift from them, uh, right? They recognize that, you know, the students that are coming to Rutgers Newark are likely workers for them, right? A pipeline of workers. And so they've resourced us for our Prudential Scholars Program. Uh, we are excited about the uh, Mellon-funded uh, Humanities uh, Scholars Program because we know a lot of students come to university and they want to be a lawyer because grandma said so. But they don't realize that in the entertainment industry there are lawyers needed, right? Or in corporate settings, they, do you follow what I mean? So we're looking at ways to help them understand how, um, um, you know, pathways that uh, point towards or nourish their their penchant for history or ethnic studies or whatever of the humanities can can feed into this. There's the... amazing collaborative work going on at Rutgers Newark under the leadership of Nancy Cantor. The Newark City of Learning Collaborative, the Honors Living and Learning Community, and the Run to the Top program are just three of them. Under Nancy's direction, Rutgers Newark has increased this enrollment of Newark students by 60% in the last few years. Colleagues, I don't, I don't have time um, to go into um, uh, detail about um, the, the collaborations with, with the mayor and the city. Uh, I want to just ask you to think about this question of what kinds of institutions of higher, of higher education a strong democracy need? To what extent does it require us using a prophetic imagination toward the sort of militative change that we need? What role does creativity in the arts and the humanities play in this regard, right? How do we challenge our own selves to use our sphere of influence to get really serious about what's possible in these academic spaces. I don't know about you, but my story is not even possible without higher education. Mm -hmm. My granddaddy couldn't have a library card legally in this country. And it is because of institutions like yours and mine that I'm blessed, not the sharpest tool in the toolkit. Please don't misunderstand me, right? But when I earned tenure at Syracuse University in 106 years. I was the third black man in the School of Education to be tenured in 106 years. What am I saying? <laughs> we have a way of understanding these ivory towers and what's possible in them that is limiting. Let us beware the shrinking imagination let us look forward to the mayor spending 15 minutes in his or her state of the city address talking about how we are robustly engaged between our campus and community. Let us stop bracketing out the aspirations of our students with respect to the arts and humanities in their knowledge making. What I didn't tell you is that Vivian doesn't see herself as an artist. <laughs> if you ask her, is she an artist? She's like, no, nah, really not, Dean. I'm, you know, I, I just like to do it. I said, Vivian, how long did it take you to do the, uh, to do the piece? Well, uh, probably about, about 25, about 25 hours. I said, okay. How long did it take you to do the research paper? She said, Dean, I did that in, you know, four or five. <laughs> do you know what I'm saying? Uh, I could go on and on. I have about 72 other slides, but what I'm going to do, Dr. Robinson, is hopefully this has been provoking enough to get some uh, conversation going. I don't know how much time we have um, to to engage in a, an exchange around Q&A, but I'm certainly uh, up for it and, and delighted that you would give me your attention. 
Yes, and, and Dr. Eatman, this has been fantastic. And I, I think the, the most important thing that I keep hearing is we have to think outside of the box. If, if we're gonna make changes and really go forward with our democracy and particularly with regard to our students, we have to think out of, outside the box. And our students want to think outside the box. And, and I love your last example with the drawing because um, in working with, with some of the students that, that I, I, I'm close to right now, they love having the opportunity to do something so different and be able to tap into their own talents and their own passions. And I think that's so important. Thank you. So I was just gonna say, anyone have a question that you would like to ask Dr. Eatman, um, please feel free to unmute yourself. You, you don't have to put it in the chat. Um, we'd love to have that one-on-one that -on -one conversation here.